very much. Okay, well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, just by way of a brief introduction, I'm a South African ornithologist, uh, conservation biologist and bird tour guide uh, and with various different hats, depending on what I'm doing. And uh, I've been going to Angola since 2002, 2003, um, visiting regularly and also lived there for a few years. So I've spent a lot of time in Angola uh, I've been involved with research, post-war research right from the beginning, and I've now uh, moved into practical conservation project phase, um, trying to run various projects for birds in Angola. And that's primarily what I'll be talking about this evening. Um, first, a, a broad overview of Angolan birds, and then specifically talking about my own projects in the country. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I'll take questions, but I'll take them at the end of the talk. So if you could please just pop them in the chat box and Derek will read them out to me at the end and then I'll, uh, I'll try and answer those um, once I've finished the presentation. Can I just ask you all to mute again? We're having a problem with muting. Um, this evening, people coming in seem to have their mics unmuted. If you could just make sure all your mics are muted, please. Okay, thank you. So, as I mentioned, the topic is birding and bird conservation in Angola. Um, and I have various affiliations. I publish books under my own name, Go Away Birding. I guide tours with Birding Africa. And then the research and conservation work I do is with the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute in Nigeria. Uh, the Kisama Foundation, which is the leading conservation NGO in Angola, and the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute, which is Africa's leading uh, ornithological research institute. So first, uh, just a brief overview of the presentation. First, I'll highlight some of the key features of Angola as a country, not just from a biological point of view, just to give you a bit of background, uh, also social history. Then I think it will help to understand the physical template which drives patterns in biodiversity. So the physical features which underlie the patterns of biodiversity we see in Angola. Um, then I'll talk about the, different, the main different habitat types found across the country before I move on to the birds, um, their diversity. And we'll look at birds and their distribution and the key birds, the most interesting birds in the country it, as a tour. Um, so I'll run you through our, our standard bird tour itinerary we run uh, and the key birds and habitats uh, which we look for and visit. And then finally, I'll end off with an overview about conservation in Angola in general and specifically talk about my two projects. So this is a map of Angola. Um, in size, it is very similar to South Africa, almost exactly the same size as South Africa. It has a population of about 33 million people, so less densely populated than South Africa, but most of the population uh, lives in the west of the country. So the east is typically sparsely populated and the central and western areas are quite densely populated. Angola is located entirely within the tropics between six and 18 degrees south, but because of the highland areas, there are some more temperate habitats too, but typically a, a tropical country. It was an ex-Portuguese colony and gained independence in the early 1970s um, after an independence struggle and an independence war. And unfortunately, this led into a very protracted civil war, which lasted almost 30 years and ended finally in 2002. So, the war in Angola is, has had a major impact on all spheres of life. Um, there's a whole generation pretty much lost in terms of education. The infrastructure was set back uh, in a big way. Um, yeah, so the, the war is still in people's minds a very big part of Angola's history. Um, but the country has moved forward. It's made big strides in developing its infrastructure and its economy. And then uh, in terms of industry and the economy, the one 
thing it is very heavily dependent on is oil. So it is the second biggest African producer of oil and 95% of its foreign revenue is dependent on uh, the sale of oil, which unfortunately has meant with the drop on oil prices that uh, it hasn't been doing nearly as well as it was in the 2000s. It also has uh, fairly significant diamond deposits, but these have been mined for a long time already. Oil is, has been exploited more recently. The, the diamonds were done very heavily first. They occur mainly in the northeast of the country. So the diamond deposits are not as rich as they were, and they're not such a big part of the economy anymore. So that's by way of brief introduction and overview of the country. Then moving on to the physical template and the maps I'm drawing on um, for this presentation come from this fantastic book, Biodiversity of Angola, which uh, if anyone's interested in obtaining, it is freely available as a PDF online. It is a, a very comprehensive summary of Angola and, was, and, and its biodiversity and was published uh, last year, I think, or, or the year before. So a very recent and up-to-date overview and freely available as a PDF. I recommend you download it if you're interested. Um, so firstly, to start with the soils, and I, I should mention I'm no expert whatsoever on soils, but this map illustrates most clearly to me the split between the east and the west of the country. Um, the complexity and diversity of soils is much higher in the west, and the east is covered almost entirely in windblown Kalahari sands, uh, often very deep, very nutrient poor, doesn't retain water. So that means that the eastern half of the country is a much poorer uniform system than the West. And this will be a, a topic coming up again and again when we look at other aspects of Angola. So all the, all the sort of sandy colored areas on the map in the East are Kalahari sands, windblown sands. Then looking at altitude and landform, there are four main elements to Angola as a country. Um, in terms of altitude and, and landforms. First, there's the coastal plain, which runs along the coast in the west. And that is uh, an area below, typically below 300 meters altitude. The width varies greatly across the country from a few tens of kilometers in the south to in Luanda area, around 100 kilometers before you rise up. Um, to any significant altitude. Then skipping inland, most of the country is covered in a plateau, which is mostly above a thousand meters in altitude. And it covers probably 80% of the country, the, the uh, plateau. The interface between the plateau and the coastal plain is probably the most significant element in terms of bio for biodiversity in Angola. And this is what we call the escarpment. It runs all the way down parallel, more or less, to the coast. Um, as I mentioned, the coastal width varies a lot. But uh, in the north, the escarpment is very broad and a gradual rise over a wide area. In parts, especially the central escarpment, it's very abrupt. And especially around Lubango in the south, the escarpment is incredibly steep. Uh, you drop over a kilometer in um, a few kilometers. Can I, can I, oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so those are three of the elements. And then the fourth elements are the highlands or the Afro-Montane areas. Um, the areas in red, typically areas above 2000 meters altitude. And these are the furthest outlying montane areas in Africa. So they're separated from any other montane areas in Africa by about 2,000 kilometers. So the nearest ones are in northern Malawi and, uh, and southern Cameroon. So those are the main elements, the coastal plain, the plateau, the escarpment, and the highlands or montane areas. Then looking at rainfall, uh, rainfall varies a lot across the country. And this uh, is reflected in the habitats, as you'll see a little bit later. But the coastal plain is typically arid. And in the southwest, very arid dry deserts, uh, the northern part of the Namib Desert with under 100 millimeters of rainfall 
per annum, all the way up to over 1,500 millimeters per annum in the highlands uh, and in the northeast. So those are the two moist areas. Rainfall is typically uh, it falls in, or rainfalls typically in summer. So the same as here, starts a little bit earlier, probably in uh, mid to late September, the first rains arrive and then carries on a little bit later with a dry spell in the middle of the, of the rainy season around you know, uh, December normally. And the rainfall and, and all the water that falls in Angola has an important, uh, is an important source for many of Africa's big rivers. Angola feeds in from the northeast, it feeds the Congo Basin. From the far east, it feeds the Zambezi system. Then, very importantly, most of the water from, from or in the Okavango system flows out of the eastern highlands of Angola. Uh, the Kunene River, and then there are several catchments or rivers that rise in the Angolan Highlands and flow west out into the Atlantic Ocean uh, on the Angolan coast, most significantly, significantly the Kwanzaa River, uh, after which the national currency is also named, and uh, other various big rivers like the Longa River, the Kebe River, the Loge River. Then moving on to habitats, so we've I think hopefully you have a bit of an understanding of the underlying yeah. template, the landforms and soils and so on. And this results in a diversity of habitats, uh, all the way from very arid deserts in the southwest, in the Namib, up to very moist savanna and patches of proper Congo Basin lowland forest in Kabinda and in the, in the northeast. Most of the country, though, is covered in Miombo woodlands and that's all on the plateau, fairly high rainfall areas, nutrient poor soils, and then in the southeast, uh, more bikeia woodlands, there are patches of mapani and so on. However, the two most outstanding habitat elements are the escarpment forests, uh, which are extensions of the Congo Basin rainforest down the escarpment, uh, which are they richer in the north and gradually as you go south, it gets drier. They become, the forests become more stunted and less diverse in tree species. Uh, but the, these forests are incredibly important for endemic birds. And then the Afromontane habitats, mostly grassland, but very small patches of forest remaining. And these habitats harbor some of the rarest birds in Angola. And in terms of general diversity, and, and this is based on, this map is based on my book, The Birders Guide to Africa, which analyzes all African countries to identify uh, the most significant countries from a birding point of view. And Angola ranks very highly. It has uh, 960 species approximately recorded. So that's the fifth highest list for any country in Africa and 24 endemics, which is a, a very significant number of Endemic South Africa, Ethiopia have more, uh, Tanzania, but not many countries have more endemics than Angola. And so just purely based on species that occur um, from a bird watching point of view, Angola ranks seventh on the comp, uh, in the African region uh, for importance. So a highly significant country. And I think probably one of the, potentially one of the biggest up and coming bird watching destinations in Africa. So I'll now take you through an overview of the birds and the habitats uh, as a bird tour. And uh, this is our standard 18 day itinerary, which we run, we've been running for five or six years now. Um, typically in the 18 days, we record between 525 and 550 bird species. So very diverse. One thing most people worry about is how rough the travel conditions are in Angola. And initially when we started running bird tours, and I think the first one was in 2005, it was a very rough destination. The roads were poor, the accommodation was poor, and you had to travel large distances between suitable accommodation. But the country's infrastructure has developed massively in the last 15 years. And the roads are generally of a reasonable standard. Uh, they've, most of them have been resurfaced 
unfortunately, of fairly, fairly poor quality. So they get pot out quite quickly, but they're already going through a second phase of renewal. So generally, the roads are actually pretty good. And the accommodation is also generally of a higher standard than most African countries. And certainly, I think, higher than you would expect if you haven't been to Angola. One thing that's been an issue for people wanting to visit Angola has been visas in the past, but also in the last five years, that's changed. South Africans no longer require visas, and almost all nationalities can apply fairly simply online and receive a pre-approved visa uh, within 24 hours, typically. So Angola really has made big strides to becoming more tourist friendly, and I think really deserves to be, be become a much bigger bird watching destination. Okay, so just to run you, sorry, I'll, I'll flip back to the map and just explain the trip. So we start off in Luanda, we then head up to Wij in the Northern Escarpment Forest. And you can see these dark patches on the satellite images. These are the Northern Escarpment Forests um, of this region. Then we move southeast to Kalandula, and Kalandula has, is, is one of the main tourist attractions in the country with spectacular waterfalls. We then cross back south to the base of the central escarpment. The Kwanzaa River flows in here, and that splits the northern escarpment from the central escarpment. So we visit Kisama area at the base of the central escarpment before heading down south into the more arid habitats at Bengela and around Lubango and Namib. And then we end off with the most significant habitats, which are highland habitats around Tundavala and Lubango and around Mount Moko. And then the central, the upper central escarpment habitats at Kumbira and around Konda before we loop back to Luanda. So that's what I'll run through now with these significant birds. So starting in Luanda, obviously we don't spend very long there. Um, it's, it's basically to, to arrive in the country, but even within walking distance of downtown Luanda, there are some endemics to be found. And that includes redback mouse bird, which occurs very widely throughout the city. It's very similar to speckled mouse bird, but has, uh, it's often quite frustrating for people because the redback's not easy to see, generally best seen in flight. But the bases of the tail, the, the sides of the bases of the tail are also white. So it's, it's uh, very closely related to speckled mouse bird, but uh, can be distinguished fairly easily. And I should mention that my book, The Special Birds of Mongolia, um, highlights all, all these birds that I'll be talking about now. Uh, also in Luanda, Rufus Tell Palm Thrush, which for Southern African birders is a real special. You have to travel to the ends of the region, to the Kenene River to look for it. But this is a, a fairly common and widespread bird on the coastal plain, and it does very well in gardens and around cities, often nesting. Uh, on people's patios and verandas and the roofs. So uh, usually seen within walking distance of our hotel in Luanda. But as I say, generally just a, a brief stay in Luanda before we move on to the Northern Escarpment, uh, which as I mentioned is an extension of the tropical lowland rainforests of the Congo Basin. And most of the birds here are Congo Basin forest birds, lots of big hornbills, um, some of the Congo Basin turacos and barbets and so on, but also a few special elements. And this photo here on the, on the left is Angolan white-throated green bull, uh, recognized by BirdLife International as an endemic species to Angola. And this is in fact the very first photo ever of one in the wild. Um, so that's one of the key birds we look for up in the Northern East Carpent Forest. This is a, a photograph of what the habitat looks like. But the real champion of this area is the endemic and endangered bronze bushrike, uh, very similar to Lourdes bushrike, but with a bright orange rather chest rather than a chest color matching the crown. Uh, it it uh, occurs on forest edge in dense tangles um, and it fortunately is, is doing all right, although it, it does have a very small population, so currently endangered. Other birds which are quite common along the escarpment, which are hard to see elsewhere, include this yellow-necked or Falkenstein's green bull. Uh, it does occur in places like Gabon and southern Cameroon, but 
it is much more abundant on the Angolan escarpment than anywhere else, uh, as far as I'm aware. So a key bird for Angola. We then move east, southeast onto the plateau. Uh, so away from the escarpment to the Kalundula Falls area. And as I mentioned, most of the country is covered in Miombo woodland as is the Kalundula Falls area. But there are also significant patches of gallery forest. And here the top bird is very localized white-headed robin chat. It is quite unusual for a robin chat in that it spends a lot of time in the upper canopy. Uh, it does come down to the ground to feed too, but often seen up in the canopy. A very large robin chat with a, a beautiful uh, call. And uh, although it's not strictly endemic to Angola, it does occur in the southern DRC. This is really the only place in the world, Kalandula Falls, where people can fairly easily go and see it. Uh, just a photograph of the falls. As I mentioned, one of the top tourist attractions in the country. There are a couple of hotels uh, of international standard at the falls where we base ourselves. And then other highlights. In the Miombo woodland, there's Anchieta's barbet, which as you can see is quite similar and closely related to White's barbet, also a Miombo bird. But uh, so Anchieta's barbet does occur also in Zambia quite widely, but often very hard to find. And in my experience, Kalundula Falls is the best place in the world to see this bird. Then sharp-tailed starling, which is another specialty for Southern Africans. Uh, in fact, in Angola, it's in, in proper Miombo woodland on the plateau, it's the most common starling. There are no Miombo blue starlings. Uh, so sharp tailed starling is typically the bird you see, and they especially common around Kalundula. Then in the gallery forests, you may be uh, familiar with this bird. We call it uh, gorgeous bushrike. But the one in this part of the world is often split and called Perrin's Bushrike. And Kalandula Falls is a good place to see it. And then along some of the larger rivers, you get uh, large colonies of red-throated cliff swallow, which is a, also a Central African bird. It does go into Gabon and to Zambia, where you can fairly easily see it. But large numbers under big road bridges in the Kalandula area. Uh, smaller than South African cliff swallow, has these white patches on the back and lacks the big white uh, markings in the tail. Okay, so that's Kalundula Falls area. And from here, we then move back towards the coast, go down the escarpment and spend some time at the base of the central escarpment, which is covered mostly in dry forest and thickets. And although the habitat doesn't look too special, this is actually one of the most endemic rich areas of Angola. Um, a lot of the endemics can be found fairly easily in this region. The bird here on the left is Montero's bushrike. Um, supposedly there are some birds in Cameroon in the mountains, but I am skeptical as to whether they actually related to Montero's bushrike from Angola. So as far as I'm concerned, Montero's bushrike is an endemic. It differs it's very, very similar to graded bushrike. The call is a long drawn out whistle, just like graded bushrike. But these pale spectacles are what distinguish it best from gray-headed bushrike, which occurs nearby, but only on top of the escarpment in woodland along the coastal plain, uh, especially in the central and northern coastal plain. At the foot of the escarpment, only Montero's bushrikes. So this is a look at what some of the habitat looks like. A lot of baobab trees, if anyone goes to northern Kruger and they think they're seeing a lot of baobabs, uh, they should visit Angola. You literally get baobab forests. Uh, a lot of thickets, uh, especially around Euphorbia. Um, so a very dry forest. And as I, as I said, it doesn't look like anything too special, but a lot of the endemics do occur here. Another of the more widespread endemics, gray striped Franklin. Uh, but is most common and most easily seen in, in these drier thickets, closely related to Scaly Franklin of Central Africa. 
pale olive green bull, which is like our terrestrial uh, brown bull, an understory, uh, leaf tossing, insectivore, skulks around, often very hard to see and very dense undergrowth. Then one of Angola's top endemics, Gabella helmet shrike. Uh, it only occurs in the drier forest, the base of the escarpment. As you can see, it's closely related to Rex's helmet shrike, but it is quite a bit smaller and the very gray mantle and back, especially contrasting with the black head and the wings, uh, make it quite easy to distinguish from Rex's. And Rex's occurs again, like with Monteria's bushrike and gray-headed bushrike, Rex's helmet shrike occurs quite close to the range of Gabella helmet shrike, but again, only on the plateau in Miombo woodlands. So the escarpment is a very important divide between the, the base of the, of the escarpment where these endemics occur and the uh, plateau, which is, as I say, not far away, probably talking 30 kilometers. Um, but these, these birds have evolved in isolation in a different habitat down here. White-fronted wattle eye, which is closely related to a common or brown-throated wattle eye from Central Africa, endemic to the escarpment region and, and rivers along the coastal plain. Then golden-backed bishop, uh, which at the time we typically run our birding tours in September, at the end of the dry season, it's when most of the birds breed. But unfortunately at that time, golden-backed bishop is not in breeding plumage. So a male in breeding plumage on the left, on the right, either a female or a male in non-breeding plumage, but it's still quite a distinctive bird with these, uh, the yellow in the eyebrow and the throat, a peachy wash on the chest, and these feathers on the shoulder, which you can see are also visible in the breeding plumage male. They retain these white tips to the feathers and that, that makes it fairly easy to distinguish from other willow birds. And it occurs in mixed flocks with them. So you do have to look quite carefully. Okay, so those are the, the key birds of the lower central escarpment. And we then make our way down the coastal plain. And the coastal plain is much more arid than the interior nearby. Uh, Luanda itself, I think, receives around, typically around 450 millimeters of rainfall. And as you go south, it gets drier and drier. And uh, we, we break our journey south in the town of Benguela, uh, which is on the coast with some very nice hotels. And inland, about 40 kilometers, you get really what is the northern extension of uh, the Namibian escarpment. And a lot of birds that we consider to be Namibian endemics are very common and easily found here, inclu including Hartlib's Franklin, much or Spurfowl. In my experience, much more common in Angola than anywhere I've been in Namibia. And white-tailed shrike. As you drive, you flush it off the road in southern Angola. It's such a common bird. Um, and then other birds like Montero's hornbill, Rufus parrot, rosy faced lovebird. Most of the birds that we regard as Namibian specials are very common here in southern Angola. We then move on to the Lubango area. And uh, Lubango is one of the most important cities and most pleasant cities in Angola, so with nice hotel accommodation. We spent three nights here and split our time between Tundavala, which is a uh, montane area surrounding the town of Lubango, and then we do a day trip into the, the coastal deserts of Namib. So at Tundavala, you're talking uh, high altitude montane grasslands and montane forest, most uh, at around 2,200 meters altitude, and lots of rocky areas. The rarest bird here is this barbet, uh, white-bellied barbet, recognized by BirdLife International uh, only fairly recently. It's closely related to white-headed barbet, but the nearest population of, of this group of birds is in central Tanzania. So a massively distant outlier of white-headed barbet are now recognized as a, an endemic species to Angola. This was the last endemic bird species in Angola to be rediscovered. It was only refound uh, by a colleague of mine in 2016. Um, and I've only seen it twice. So this is very much a hit and miss bird. We are worried about it. it there's a, a big museum in Lubango uh, 
where researchers actively collected birds in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, I think there are around 30 specimens collected from the Lubango area in the museum there. Um, and it's almost certainly due to the destruction of ha its habitats that it's almost impossible to find now. So it's undergone very serious declines and, and is globally threatened. This is a, a photo of the montane grasslands right up on the plateau. Um, this is not the main escarpment, but as you can see, uh, shrubby forest along the edge um, and proper patches of Afro-Montane forest on the main escarpment. Some small patches of Afro-Montane forest. Very scenic area and uh, tremendous views from the main viewpoint, dropping uh, a thousand meters down into the coastal plain. Other key birds here are the endangered endemic Swestris Franklin. Uh, the largest known populations are in the number and number mountains in, at Mount Moko, but Tundavala is uh, the place where I've most successfully managed to find it on tours. So uh, a very secretive forest edge bird, which likes dense bracken, rarely comes out into the open. Um, so you have to be lucky to get a sighting of it, popping out onto a rock or something like that. Angola cave chat, which most of you know from our bird books now because it has been found in northern Namibia, but this is very much an Angolan bird. Um, and Tundavale is the easiest place to see it. You can drive on a paved road and uh, watch it from your vehicle if you're lucky. So quite common in the rocky areas in Tundavale. Angola slaty flycatcher. Uh, which is related to the slaty flycatchers found in East Africa and Ethiopia. So uh, a, a very typical montane element, but highly isolated from the others. And this is a forest edge bird. It occurs on, uh, around the edges of the small patches of Afro-Montane forest up at Tundavala and also at places like, like Mount Moko. And as I mentioned, the other thing we do from Lubango is do a day trip into the coastal forest, uh, coastal deserts, sorry, of Namib. And it's uh, an incredibly diverse transect that we drive. We start off at 2000 meters altitude, driving across the part of plateau through grassland, dr uh, drop down the very steep escarpment with tall cliffs. And at the base of the escarpment, you get Mopani woodlands and gallery forests. And then slowly, as you move towards the coast, it gets drier and drier until you're in very sparse open desert. This is Bengilla Longbow Vlark, which is one of our main targets and very common, uh, especially near the coast where it's more arid. Just a view of the top of Leva Pass, where the road starts dropping off the escarpment, high cliffs, barrows, eagles, black stalks. Uh, Bradfields and alpine swifts breeding. And this is some scenery from the south of Angola, not all taken where we go on our tour, but this, this is from Iona National Park, a really spectacular desert scenery. Some lovely mountain passes to go through, so on, on the way to Iona National Park. One of the other interesting birds that we look for on this, on this day trip is a bird which you will probably recognize as being very close related to Meeves starling, Meeves or long-tailed starling, exactly the si same size and shape, and but an endemic bird recognized also by BirdLife International called Bengela starling. It's got a much purpler gloss and with bits of bronze in and is much less glossy than Meeves starling. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that it's a good split, but it's certainly something distinctive and, and interesting to see. Um, other birds that we look for on that day include Cinderella waxbill, um, Rupal's Koran, and so on. So your typical northern Namibian birds uh, that we look for. Then we start our journey back to Luanda. And after Lubango, we spend 
the full four nights in the Mount Moko area, which is an incredibly diverse area of around Mount Moko itself, which is the highest mountain in Angola. There are some fairly significant patches of Afromontane forest, lots of pine and grassland. And then the greater area is covered in Nyombo woodlands and dambos, which are broad grassy drainage lines um, that flow through the Miombo woodlands. The bird in the image here is Bokaja's sunbird, uh, a near endemic to Angola. It has been recorded from the DRC too, but Angola is the only place you're gonna find it. And this occurs in the broad grassy drainage lines, specifically in Miombo woodland. Um, it's not around the mountain itself. This is a view of Mount Moko. And uh, I'll be talking quite a bit about Mount Moko and my own conservation project there. Um, but you can see some of the very small remnants of Afromontane forest visible above the village. The main patches are behind the mountain. You can't see them from here. Uh, most of the area covered in short grassland with uh, protea bushes scattered about. And then, as I mentioned, the larger region covered in Miombo woodlands with these beautiful drainage lines uh, with grassland. And all these habitats together make for an incredibly rich birding experience. Uh, it's one of my favorite birding regions in the world, Mount Moko. This is Margaret's Battis, uh, which was described first from Mount Moko. It also occurs in Zambia, um, but is a very localized species and in Angola is only known from Western Highlands. So there's a big gap in its distribution from Western Zambia to Western Angola, where no birds are known to occur. Here it occurs in Afromontane forest. Uh, it's getting rarer and rarer at Mount Moko. So uh, a difficult bird to see. It requires a big hike, um, but one of the top birds here. In Bokaja's Akalat, uh, which is also more widespread, occurs into Zambia. Um, but uh, one of the one of the Afromontane forest birds, which is common on the mountain. Western green tinkerbird on the left, which uh, is an isolated and endemic subspecies, Angolensis, to the Angolan mountains. And there are quite a few uh, more widespread species like olive woodpecker, African olive pigeon, which occur in the montane forests at Mount Moko and the surrounding highlands. Uh, but which you don't find for a very large distance, you know, over a thousand kilometers uh, from these areas. Then black-faced canary, which is uh, also a bit more widespread, but most of the global range falls within Angola, and it's uh, quite common in the montane and escarpment areas. Closely related to the citrals and forest canary. And then this bird, which uh, is Angola's newest endemic, it was described as a subspecies of rock-loving cysticula, which is closely related to lazy cysticula. Uh, and the calls are not dissimilar between rock-loving and lazy. But the very first time I heard this bird, I knew it had to be something different. I'll play the call for you. Um, So an incredibly musical little song. It lives along forest edge, uh, spends most of its time in, in trees and bushes. Rock loving cysticula is quite a terrestrial bird. Um, and so that, that is an overlooked species. We, we managed to collect some blood, for, uh, catch some birds and miss nets and collect blood. And we've run the genetics and we know it is completely unrelated to uh, rock loving or lazy cysticula and is now recognized by BirdLife International as Quambo cysticula, uh, an endemic Angolan bird. Other birds in the Mount Moko area, this very beautiful black collared bulbul, also found in northwest Zambia and Gabon. Fullerborn's long claw, which is quite common uh, in the Dambo grasslands, very similar to yellow-throated long claw, but lacking the black streaking most significantly the black streaking on the sides of the chest below the black collar. Then one of my favorite birds, Brothers Martin. Uh, before 2005, it was known only from the Congo Basin. Um, and in 2005, I discovered a breeding population of these birds in the Angolan Highlands. 
uh, very still very localized. I didn't find too many pairs, um, but a bird which you basically couldn't see anywhere in the world, um, which we now find on, on all our birding trips in Angola. It looks similar to Masquerine Martin from from Madagascar, but it's it's much more closely related to Banded Martin, in fact, um, and the songs are quite similar. Bokaj's weaver, which is uh, a near endemic, just creeps into northwest Zambia. Um, and if you time it right, you can see it in, Z in Zambia, but it's much more easily seen in Angola um, and breeds commonly over the little rivers that run across uh, the landscape around Mount Moko. Then more familiar birds like locust finch, uh, not common, but uh, found in some of the dambos. Beautiful black and rufous swallow, which is also just creeps over the border into northwest Zambia and into southwestern DRC, but much more easily seen in Angola than anywhere else. Ustalet sunbird on the left, which you would be forgiven for mistaking for a white bellied sunbird, uh, in appearance a bit bluer on the throat, and it also has a a smattering of maroon coloration through the band here, but the calls are especially different. Um, and this occurs commonly in dwarf shrubland and, and open woodland up on the, in the highlands of Angola. Um, you, don't, you get white bellied on the coastal plain. In Salvadoris Eremomola on the right here, which to me is not a good split, it's uh, very close related to yellow bellied Eremomola which itself varies a lot in the amount of yellow it has on the belly. So Salvadoris is a Miombo bird with a lot of yellow on the belly. And if you use your imagination, you can see a little bit of an olive tinge in the mantle. So those two features uh, are the reason for it being split. To me, the song is identical to yellow belly Deramomina too. So but a, a bird people want to see, even though I, I think it's, it's just a subspecies of the yellow belly Deramomina. Very beautiful uh, counterpart is black necked Eremomola, which is a localized Miombo woodland bird. Uh, it is found fairly widely in Zambia, but it's never common. And Mount Moko is a very good area to find it. Okay, and then our final port of call on the tour is after Mount Moko, the upper central escarpment around Kumbira Forest and Konda. And these, are, as I mentioned, are dry forests related to the Congo Basin Forest, but less diverse in tree species. And it is here that three of Angola's endangered endemic birds occur. And these, this is probably the highest conservation priority for Angola is uh, the central escarpment forests. On the left is Pulitzer's Longville, uh, endangered, found only in, uh, on the upper edge of the escarpment, over, um, spread over about 200 kilometers, 200 to 300 kilometers, but not continuously, and it's getting very rare. It used to be quite easy to find in Kumbira Forest, um, and the numbers have certainly declined quite a lot in the last 15 years. The beautiful national bird, red crest of Turaco, uh, is one of the iconic birds of the, of the central escarpment. It does also occur in other areas such as Kalundula and a little bit into the northern escarpment, but the central escarpment and Kumbira forest is really the core of its range. Then Gabella Akalat, endangered and Angola's most localized endemic. It has a total world range with about a north-south about 70 to 80 kilometers and east-west probably only about 15 kilometers, so a tiny range. Uh, fortunately, it can live in quite small patches of remaining habitat and it's, despite a lot of habitat clearance, it's still quite common um, in the little patches of remaining dense undergrowth in, in Kumbira forest and surrounding areas. Gabella bushrike, which is closely related to 
bronze bushrike of the northern escarpment, but it's lost the bright orange or lacks the bright orange wash on the chest. And this is the Angolan bird about which I'm most concerned. Uh, I did surveys in Kumbira Forest in 2010 at 200 different points. I found Gabela bushrike back then at 25 of those 200 points. And at that stage, on a bird tour, I didn't have to look for Gabella bushrike. I just saw it while I was bird watching. Now it has become very, very difficult to find. I've been back uh, to all the sites at which I recorded the bird in 2010, um, in the last few years, and I haven't managed to refind any at Kumbira Forest. So we've seen probably at least a 90% decline in 10 years in Gabella bushrike at Kumbira Forest, which 15 years ago was one of the main strongholds. Um, and I find it at one or two very small other patches of forest, but no longer in Kumbira Forest. Then a, another recent bird life split, uh, close related to naked faced barbet. This is pale throated barbet, which is endemic to the central escarpment and the montane areas. Um, it has also declined alarmingly. It used to occur at Mount Moko, it was collected there in the 1950s and 60s, but it's now extinct at Mount Moko. And it has also declined significantly along the central escarpment. And now is a bird which, I I, unless I know exactly where they occur, I don't just bump into the monitor. Um, so very concerned about the conservation status of the species. Other escarpment endemics include Hartitz Camaroptera. Uh, again, a bit like Salvadori's Aeromobile, I'm not convinced it's necessarily a good split. It is a bit of a mixture of grayback Camaroptera with its grayback and greenback Camaroptera with its green tail, um, but a distinctive form associated with the Angolan escarpment. And then other more widespread uh, Congo Basin or lowland rainforest birds, which can also be seen at Kumbira, include a very striking and beautiful little yellow-bellied wattle eye. Forest scrub robin, which is more easily seen on the Angolan escarpment than anywhere else. This bird has a very, very curious distribution. It occurs in the Upper Guinea forests from Ghana to Liberia, Sierra Leone. Then it occurs in the Eastern DRC and Western Uganda, you can see it at some leaky forest. And then the third population um, on the Angolan escarpment. So very odd distribution. It's in drier forests, typically on the edge of the main forest blocks, um, but certainly more numerous in Angola than anywhere else. This is Angola batis, which is a near endemic. It does occur into the, some of the dry forests of the Southern escarpment, uh, sorry, into the dry forests of Southern Gabon. Um, this is a female. The male is almost identical to chin spot batis male, although a bit smaller, but the female lacks the, the chin spot as the rufous chest band. And then just for good measure, I've thrown in one mammal species, which is uh, especially important to me. This is Angola's newest primate species. Uh, I discovered it in 2005, and I was very privileged to host the World Authority, Simon Vieta, um, on bush babies. And we spent two weeks doing field work together with some of his colleagues and uh, eventually published a paper describing this um, as Angolan dwarf galago. Uh, and it's named for Kumbira Forest, where, where I first found it. Okay, so that's a summary of the bird tour, some of the key birds and key habitats. And I'd like to spend the last bit of the talk just highlighting a bit more about the conservation threats uh, in Angola. So firstly, uh, I've been drumming on about Western Angola and the escarpment and montane forests and how important they are with all the endemic birds. And a map of the conservation areas here in green uh, is most significant for its gaps. Um, none of the, the escarpment runs more or less down here. Uh, the montane areas are here, and then the escarpment runs down to Lubango. So you can see that there are no conservation areas protecting any of the habitats 
that are really key to Angola's most endangered and localized endemic bird species. Um, so initially, the work I did focused on finding out where these birds occur and what their population sizes were. And since then, I've moved into a more practical conservation phase, trying to set up projects to conserve these habitats. Um, but first, briefly, an overview of the main conservation, practical conservation projects in Angola, of which there are very few. Uh, there's the giant sable project, which conserves Angola's national mammal and endemic subspecies of sable antelope, which is run by friend Pedro Espinto in Kangandala and Guando National Parks. Then there's a very successful and active turtle breeding um, conservation project, which runs on the coast. Uh, and started off at Rio Longa, working with local communities to protect the breeding beaches of uh, various species of, of sea turtle. And then my own two projects, which um, occur at Kumbira and at Mount Moko. I've also added two other sites here, the Northern Escarpment and the Number Mountains, which after Mount Moko and Kumbira, to me, are the highest conservation priorities in Angola. So what are the, some of the con main conservation threats in the country? Well, it's pretty much the same as anywhere else, but possibly a bit more extreme. Um, there's a general lack of capacity for work and a general lack of priori prioritization by the government. Um, and it's, it's understandable, especially after a long civil war, there's a need to strengthen the economy, to build infrastructure. So the government's focus has very much been on other things. Also a major lack of law enforcement uh, people aren't even aware of what the environmental laws are. Commercial logging is a fairly big threat uh, in the northern escarpment forests. And uh, one problem for bird watchers is that, is that actually managing to find any accessible uh, northern escarpment forest is quite hard. All the accessible patches have been logged and you can longingly stare at some beautiful patches up on, on the highest and least accessible mountains. Um, but getting there to see the birds is very tricky. Uh, charcoal production is a major issue and, and generally the overdependence on natural resources. Most Angolans uh, cook on charcoal, even in the city of Rwanda, most Angolans don't have electricity. So masses of charcoal are produced mainly from Yombo woodland on the plateau and trucked in to Luanda uh, for cooking. And then bushmeat trade, especially in the north of the country, um, is very significant. So just to run through some of those, here's a photograph of uh, bags of charcoal being produced. This is taken in dry forest at the foot of the escarpment, the central escarpment. So a lot of Gabela helmet shrike habitat is disappearing to this charcoal. Uh, also widespread agriculture, and this is subsistence agriculture clearing Miombo woodland. Um, right up the slopes, you can see very rocky ground, difficult to cultivate. Uh, but the, the highlands are densely populated, and so there's real pressure on remaining habitats. This is slash and burn agriculture happening at Kumbira Forest, and probably uh, in the last 15 years, up to 60 or 70 percent of Kumbira Forest has been slashed and burnt. Uh, first, the trees are chopped down, allowed to dry out, and then burnt to provide uh, nutrients for growing crops like maize and cassava. Bushmeat, as I mentioned, uh, rampant. The photo on the right is actually taken in Kisama National Park. So widespread hunting even in the National Park. And here the scouts have uh, confiscated from poachers a, a haul of bushback and, and dikers. Okay, moving on to my projects. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, focus mainly on finding out where the birds occurred and thus to identify the most important places to conserve. And for the last 10 years, I focused my attentions primarily on two places, Mount Moko and Kumbira. Um, so Mount Moko, as I mentioned, is the highest mountain. Um, the habitat here that we are most concerned about is Afromontane forest. And just to give you an overview of Afromontane forest in Angola, Brian Huntley from who, who many of you will have heard of, uh, one of South Africa's leading environmental biologists, worked in Angola in the 1970s. 
and visited Mount Moko, estimating approximately 200 hectares of Afromontane forest remaining. And at the time, that was the largest patch the, the, or the location with the most Afromontane forest left in Angola, 200 hectares. Uh, fortunately, since then, we have discovered, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll put forward. We have discovered that in the number mountains, there is more forest. Uh, we estimate about 600 hectares, but it's still minuscule. So really only 800 hectares of Afromontane forest uh, in Angola in significant forest patches. There are some smaller patches along the escarp upper escarpment and other places, but uh, really a dire situation. Fortunately, as you can see from the terrain in the number of mountains, incredibly rocky. Uh, people don't live up here. They can't cultivate the soils. And so fortunately, the number of mountains are relatively well protected. I haven't visited them for 10 years. So it's a priority is to get back there and make sure things are still under control. Um, at Mount Moko, going back uh, to Mount Moko, the situation is very different. Uh, this is a comparative photo of the same village um, and the same patch of forest taken in 1973 and uh, just a few years ago in 2016. And you can see, and this is happening to most of the patches on the mountain, the forest is getting hammered. My understanding after, after several years of observation is that what happened is people chopped trees at the edge of the forest. This broke the natural protective uh, border of the forest to grassland fires. And since that border had, has been disrupted, grassland fires now burn into the forests. And uh, currently the main threat to the forest is not actually direct consumption of, tree, of wood and trees by people, but actual, uh, actually grassland fires burning into habitat, which they previously wouldn't have. Um, and here's a, a, a photograph of the largest remaining patch of Afromontane forest on Mount Moko. And you can see these patches of bracken uh, where the fire has been burning its way into the forest, killing the large trees and converting the habitat uh, to basically dense bracken beds. So this is the main threat here. Um, this is a satellite image of the mountain here showing that's that big forest patch that we just looked at. The lower valleys have already lost all their forest. These would have been the largest patches of forest down the valleys. So it's disappearing very quickly. Um, we now know that there's probably only about 70 hectares at most uh, left at Mount Moko um, from an estimated 200 in the 1970s. So my work is focusing on turning that around. Uh, initially, we started off by tree planting. We've established a local nursery at the village of Kanjonde, working with, I employ eight villagers to run the nursery in my absence. Um, and twice a year, I go up there and we plant trees. Um, so, so far the project is quite small, but it's expanding rapidly now. We've planted over 2000 trees and our nursery has been expanded to hold over 2000 plants. Uh, there are various things we want to do to improve our methods, um, including teaching local villagers to grow the plants from, from seeds, the trees from seeds. Currently we've been harvesting saplings from various springs on the mountain where birds come to drink and defecate seeds. So we're taking surplus saplings uh, to plant back to the mountain, um, but we need to learn to grow these trees from seeds. My main focus in the last three or four years has turned to stopping fires. Um, and initially this has started off with uh, working with the community, hiring groups of up to 60 workers to manually clear fire breaks. And you can see a fire break cut here, um, protecting this patch that we're trying to rehabilitate to forest um, from surrounding grasslands and the fires enter from the outside. We've also raised funds now uh, at, to bring fire experts in from South Africa working on an uh, organization called Working on Fire to come and train a group of 20 villagers at Mount Moko to use fire to control fire. So in other words, to teach them to burn fire breaks. And this will be a much more efficient method. We've already seen just from clearing fire breaks by hand, what a big difference it has made to um, the regeneration of the forest. And this has now become our main focus. The work was meant to happen last year, but um, obviously 
due to reasons we all know about, it was impossible to travel to Angola and do that work. I'm hoping we can do it in May this year, but it may be deferred for another year after that. But I believe that once we've trained the villagers and equipped them, that uh, we'll be able to protect all the patches of Afro-Montane forest on Mount Moko um, from fire. And uh, that should see a very rapid recovery from, of these forests. Um, they're no longer threatened, as I say, that much by direct use. And then we've engaged the community um, and we understand very much that the people live a very subsist uh, subsistence lifestyle here. They're heavily dependent on natural resources, but we've taken our time to get to know the community um, and gently lead them to the understanding that the environment to them is very important, um, that their environment has been degraded and that we need to work together to try and uh, reverse some of the damages that have been caused and to ensure that uh, the environment stays healthy in the long run. And here we are sitting in a, in a village meeting. This is my colleague, Kedlin, fantastic young Angolan biologist who's been working with me on this project uh, for the last five years or so. Then uh, just briefly to end off, I'll talk about Kumbira Forest. Uh, this is a photograph over Kumbira Forest taken in 2003. As you can see, side to side, uh, beautiful forest, very intact still. As I mentioned, the situation has changed completely in the last 15 years. Um, and the situation here is much more complex socially than at Mount Moko. There are quite a few, I think it's about five villages just in this area that you can see. Uh, so there's community land, there's also privately owned land, um, but which is not really actively being farmed, although the owners are allowing people to log um, on their properties too. And uh, as I mentioned, much more socially complex. We've had funding from the BP Conservation Leadership um, Program to engage communities in the valley um, and also raise issues around the environment this area was a famous coffee growing region. Um, so one aspect we have been thinking about trying to tackle is, is encourage people to grow shade coffee. But the one problem with shade coffee is that it might be good for canopy species, but the endemics uh, of Angola are understory species. So it might not work well in this case. And what we're targeting here is working with the Rainforest Trust. We're hoping to set up a private reserve to actually purchase some of these farms and manage the farms uh, for conservation of the birds here. It's still in the very early phases. Um, we're just finishing um, a one-year project to investigate the possibilities with Rainforest Trust. And uh, hopefully in the next two or three years, Rainforest Trust will fully commit to funding a full project and we can start with establishing a reserve here. So that brings me to the end of my talk. There are many people I need to thank, uh, all the various photographers, especially Tasha Schoes and Tasha Leventis who supplied most of the photos. Um, I just, I'm especially grateful to the people who have supported the conservation work I've been doing in Angola. And that is, is mostly through Aplori and Tasha Leventis who's been funding the work now for 10 years. Um, but other organizations, the Rufford Foundation, Conservation Leadership Program, and more recently, we are starting to work more closely with the Rainforest Trust and the African Bird Club. Um, and just to be cheeky, I'm going to uh, do a bit of self-promotion here. Um, I've published two books, uh, which I'm offering on special uh, associated with this talk. If you're interested in, in purchasing either of, these, either of these books, please do contact me after my talk. Um, as I mentioned, they're on special. And then I'm also running a Karoo Amal and Bird Watching Tour um, in March. If anyone's interested in that, please do contact me. Um, and there's my email address. So thank you. That's, that's what I have to say. Um, ah, thanks very much, Michael. That's, uh, that's great. Uh, that was a really interesting whirlwind tour of uh, Angola. And uh, I hadn't 
realized how many species of birds Angola had. Uh, that, that was really interesting. So I'm going to just uh, have a look at the, the chat here and see if um, there are some questions. Um, there's lots of uh, very positive comments and kudos and uh, 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 good things being said. I won't read all of those out, uh, but you. the chat is there if you want to afterwards. Um, <clears throat> do you get into the protected area where giant sable occurs? That's from Jonathan <laughs> Stacey. Um, I have been there, but I'm good friends with Pedro Vespinto, who runs the project. Um, there was talk of opening the reserve up to visitors, uh, but as far as I'm aware, that has not been done. So it's not possible for anyone to visit the reserve and see and see the sable. Um, in Kangandala National Park, they're all in a big, it's a very large breeding enclosure. You can drive around for hours and not see them. Um, and then in Luanda Reserve, which has the larger population, they're all free roaming. But uh, yeah, it's not possible to visit either reserve at the moment. And then Jonathan also asks, are there any IBAs identified in the Northwest? There are lots of IBAs identified. So the IBAs of Africa were, the book was written in around 2000. And the thing to remember is that there was no new information out of Angola after about 1973. So for the 30 years leading up to the IBAs, uh, the publication of the African IBA book, uh, we had no real new information. So although there are quite a few recognized in the country and uh, Mount Moko is an important, is an IBA, um, there's a Gabela IBA. The, the actual boundaries of many of the IBAs are incorrect. Um, and, and we have very little real information. But so one of the tasks I hope to do in the next year or so is to update some of the boundaries for the IBAs working with BirdLife International. Um, I do work quite closely with BirdLife. I, I feed all the information I have into their red list assessments um, and also yeah, into the things like IBAs. And then Peter Sullivan is asking how, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we know now that the tour is 18 days, but what is the cost? I don't know if you can share that here. Um, I, to be honest, I can't remember, but if you visit the African, uh, Burning Africa website, our tour brochures are there. It's, it's priced in dollars. It is very expensive for South Africans as is most of, of Africa. But uh, please visit uh, birdingafrica.com and, and the brochures are there with prices. And Elizabeth Scaries is asking, where does Michael get funding for the projects? <laughs> so I, I, I did end off, uh, I'll just pop back to, to the people. So the AP Leventus Ornithological Research Institute and Tasso Leventus have been especially supportive. So they've been providing core funding for the conservation work for 10, at least 10, it's, I think it's the 12th year now. Um, and then I've written applications um, to the Rufford Foundation and the Conservation Leadership Program, who've both funded uh, projects. As I say, the Rainforest Trust is coming on board now. Um, it's a very big, well-funded organization interested in purchasing land for conservation. So uh, working with them at Kumbira and then the African Bird Club have provided some, some smaller grants for some of the work I've done. And they're also coming on board uh, to help with fundraising for Mount Moko, too, specifically. And then uh, Chun Fai Lo is asking, which field guide do you recommend for birding in Angola? <laughs> uh, well, so for, my, for the unique birds, uh, my own little guide, Special Birds of Angola, highlights 70 of the top birds. But the only field guide to cover all of the birds in one book is Birds of Africa South of the Sahara. Um, the distribution maps are not very accurate. Um, the, the photos in the book also, obviously, in, in the Special Birds of Angola book, depict the birds better than the illustrations, which were mostly drawn from skins. Um, at that time, there were very few photos of these birds. So I think a combination, probably, of those two um, will get you through. And then uh, the last question that I'm seeing so far is uh, Kathy McClung is asking, do you have a special shot available for people to use as a screensaver with your name on it? 
<laughs> That's a very nice idea. Thank you. I don't at the moment, but maybe it's something I should make. Um, a screen, a screen save, a shot of uh, of Angola. If you, it's a nice idea. Thank you. And then, uh, oh, sorry, it's a, the chat's just moved so uh, too fast. Uh, um, uh, Marchi Wing is asking, uh, are your books available in North America? Uh, yes. Uh, well, only the, sorry, at the moment, only The Birders Guide to Africa. It's av available through, I need to get it right, Beautio Books. I think Subbutio is the UK version. Beautio Books in the US stocks my book. And then Bo Schroyer says, I'm moving to Angola from USA, Wambo province. I would love to visit with you. Is email a good way to get started? Indeed, yes. Yeah. There are, there are some other keen bird watchers living in Wambo province. And then there's loads and loads and loads of kudos and really great uh, people saying really great presentation and obrigado and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, thanks and, to everyone. Yeah. Uh, but that seems to be the end of the questions. Um, there, well, was a, there was a little issue when you were giving your presentation. You had a, uh, you had a, um, uh, it was a cysticola that you played the sound out, but sorry, we yes. couldn't hear it. So I think when you, when you played, when you shared your screen, you didn't share your computer sound. So maybe if you don't mind, would you be willing to play it now? And you just when you share your screen, just have to make sure that you choose to share the uh, computer sound at the same time. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thanks for that. Let me just pop back to that. Uh, just seeing. Do you, where do I do that? When you uh, go to share your screen, I don't know if it's advanced sharing options. So yeah, share sound. Share. Okay, I've got it here. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Thank you. So hopefully this works now. So this is the song, and uh, it gives the song, it carries on for up to 10 minutes like this. Anyone who knows Lazy and Rock Having Sisticola, the call is completely different. Um, very striking little song. OK. Cool. So uh, there aren't any more questions. I just want to say thanks, everybody, for, for joining us on Learn the Birds and for joining uh, Michael on his tour of Angola. And hopefully we will see some of you back here next week where we're going to New Zealand. Thank you, everyone. And also just to say, if anyone has other questions about Angola, please feel free to email me, um, goawaybirding at gmail.com. Thanks again and good night everybody or good afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. Bye bye. Thanks, Derek. Cheers, Michael. Thanks a lot. Yeah, hopefully everyone enjoyed that. Judging by the comments, I would say so. So I'm, uh, I'm about to end it. Uh, I, I presume Perfect. everybody has had a chance to have a look at the comments and everything. So I'll say bye-bye again. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Thanks for hosting. Cheers.